right. Good morning, church family. It is good to see each and every one of you here this morning. And happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that are out there. Um, we have some great things in store today, not just um, for Mother's Day, but as we worship God this morning, which is hopefully why each and every one of us have gathered here today. We do want to, as usual at this time during the service, let you know about a couple of announcements. First of all, we have an opportunity to come together to do some ministry this week. So tomorrow morning at 1030 in the church office, we um, have the opportunity to help assemble some packets and packages for local missions. Um, it's going to include um, putting together, stuffing about 100 water bottles, um, putting 1,000 sets of gloves into, into groups for some, some PPE or some personal protective equipment as we've come to know it in this last year or so. has been donated for some local missions, including Casa de Amor, which is one of the missions that we support. So we have the opportunity, and um, it'll take a lot of hands, but as we know, many hands make the work light. And so we want to encourage you, join us at 1030 tomorrow in the church office, right after prayer time. We'll begin putting these packets together. Also with that, some of you may have seen that in the email that went out this week, but we also have another opportunity to minister to some of the missionaries that we support this week. We heard last month in the missions moment that about across nations and how we support the work of Milt Sherlson there. And we have the opportunity to reach out to him. His and Anita's daughter, Suzanne, um, is currently undergoing treatments for cancer. And so Anita is down here in the Chandler area with their daughter, ministering to her. And there are some things that, that we can do, and hopefully we can continue this ministry. But right now, if you have any items, um, such as gift cards for food and gas, or coloring books, journals, sketchbooks, um, maybe puzzle books, or hand sanitizer, there is a list that went out in the email, and if you don't have that list or didn't get it, just please see me or call the office. But those office items can be dropped off at the office during the week, or you can see Mona McDonald um, this Sunday or next Sunday and get those items to her, along with maybe some handwritten cards or notes of encouragement to the family. And um, our We Care team will be putting a basket together to deliver that, just as a way of encouraging one of our missionary families. So we want to encourage you to be a part of either one of those ministries or maybe even both this week. And we also want to let you know that the choir will be having a brunch to celebrate the end of the choir season this, this Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. at Steve and Linda's house. And so they are going to be also, I guess you all are viewing a full-length feature movie on the life of Fanny Crosby. And so just please let the choir know how much you've appreciated their ministry and their leading in worship, their faithfulness from August of last year through this May. We're grateful to God for the choir's faithfulness and for their beautiful music that they bless us with each and every week. Um, for this summer, if you are interested in being a part of an ensemble or a small group during the summer months, please let Linda know so that she can include you in that. Um, we need as many people as possible to be a part of the music ministry here at Sun Lakes Community Church. So we wanted to let you know about those things. And with that, I'm going to ask Linda to lead us off with a call to worship.
Thank you so much, choir. You know, how many times have you been to a Mother's Day service and, and they've faithfully gone to Proverbs 31, right? And talked about that. Do you realize that that's not just addressed to mothers? We have some women in this room. You're not a mom. And that's by choice. This morning, early this morning, I had the privilege of talking to a woman. And I want to tell you this story, y'all. She, in college, began to date a great guy that has been a lifelong friend of mine. And he was called to be a youth minister and a music minister. And as they dated and courted and then as they got married, it, it dawned on both of them that it, God wasn't calling them to have a biological child. They were to care for all the children that came through their life. And I called her this morning, and her name happens to be Tracy. And I said, Tracy, how many young people do you think you've ministered to over the years? And she says, Mitch, I don't know. And I said, well, let's just do the math. You and David were pastors, or David was a youth pastor, and you were his supporter of a ministry that averaged about 75 to 175 students for how many years? 21 years. And I said, that's a lot of students. That's a lot of students. Tracy, how many of those young ladies do you think you because the mom was absent in their life and there was no role figure, do you think that you helped direct in the right direction? And the phone got really quiet. And then in a very broken voice, she said, you know, I don't know. And I said, Tracy, you are as important as any mother has ever been. So moms, we acknowledge you and we honor you. I love the fact that you, you all realize that none of us would be in this room if it were not for a mom, right? Y'all get that part. <laughs> but you know what? I also understand that some of you have chosen, for whatever reason, not to play that physical role, but to serve in that emotional role in others' lives. And so, ladies... Today we thank you. Today we honor you. Today we say thank you so much for allowing God to use your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your unconditional love for a lot of rascals like me and others to help us understand that there's a God that loves us and has a plan for our lives. You made sure that our shoes were tied and our shirts were buttoned in the right way. And many of you made sure that we made it to church. Thank you. So it's our hope and our prayer that today, even though we're not preaching on Proverbs 31, we are talking about gardening. And the truth is, ladies, you're a whole lot better at that than we are. When I say we, I'm talking about guys. Own it, men. Just own it. But thank you. Thank you for your love and your support for us. Thank you for, as I said just a moment ago, your unconditional love. Most of all, thank you for showing up in our lives. Father, I come before you now, and we have already invoked your presence into our worship. We thank you for bringing us here today, but we pause yet for one more moment, and we thank you for the moms in this room. There are some women in this room that have had more children than I've got probably fingers or toes. And there are some women in this room that have never had a child, but yet they have done their best to invest in others. And God, we just praise you for both. We thank you, God, 
that you have allowed us to be a part of so many mentors in our lives. And would we constantly, especially today, but would we constantly take time to thank those that have said, I am going to show up each and every day and make a difference in someone's life. Father, I thank you today for godly women. I thank you for godly moms and grandmothers. I thank you, God, for using them to help make us as a body of Christ, the garden that you want it to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And with a smile on your face, everyone said. Amen. Sister Linda. Good morning. So good to see all you this morning. And um, for this week, I picked some favorites of moms uh, all over the place. Uh, one of the songs we're going to sing is No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. And I remember that being a favorite of both of my grandmas. And so um, let's stand. Colossians 3.16 says, Sing with gratitude in your hearts to God. So let's do that this morning.
Um, I have uh, three children. We were supposed to sit, we're trying to do some generations here, so Mona might take your chair. Sorry. <laughs> I had to write down how old my kids are. I, I think that after they're 21, you don't want to think about it anymore. So <laughs> anyway, I have three sons. Um, Scott is 49, Ryan is 44, and Brad is 42. I, like Dee, have several godchildren, and I've had tons of children because I've taught school for 43 years. So. Okay. Okay, so we kind of know, you know, there's your background on kids, and as I was asked to do this interview, one of the things that, that occurred to me is we hear a lot about what it's like to be a mother of preschoolers or a mother of teenagers, and there's all sorts of books and bookstores about that. serve the Lord in their calling, however that may look. It's different 
what God's called them to be. Um, my two of my sons are police officers, or two were. One is now an owner of Chick Fil A. He's retired. The other one's already looking at retirement, and one is in the oil business in uh, lives in Tennessee. But it's been a it's just been a real joy to see them take things that they learned growing up and incorporate them into their own families and their own lives. A challenge for me is um, having three sons and no daughters is, uh, again, to learn that um, it is true. Um, when, a, when a son takes a wife, he is, what, what is it? The saying is, when a, a woman takes a husband, she's still a daughter for the rest of her life. When a man takes a wife, he's, um, gosh, I had that this morning early. Who knows it? Who knows? Huh? He's gone. He's gone. Yes, he is. He is just gone. Yeah. And and that's and that I I wanted to say that in as a challenge that it it's been a challenge to have my relationship with my sons change, but the joy of that is to have three beautiful daughter in laws to love and to get to know and and to develop a relationship with, and then um, and then just. To have grandchildren has been awesome. We have we have seven grandsons and one granddaughter, <laughs> and, and she's been really interesting for me because um, I've always had boys in my life, you know. But I'm grateful for my teaching experience because that exposed me to girls, and <laughs> and I'm doing good with that. But that that's what I would say. That's great. So my
the cake. As, I, I agree with Mona, this was a, a hard question, but as I reflected on it, um, I'm overwhelmed by the fact that God has never failed to bring people alongside us at the point of our need, at the time that we needed them. Um, <clears throat> when Steve and I entered this journey of parenthood, we, we did it together and we've stuck together. The kids have never been able to pit one of us against the other. And uh, that's been a blessing to me to know that he has my back and I hope it's a blessing to him to know that I have his. Um, I would say, um, in addition to all the things the others have said, um, the church and the Christian school and the family working together were invaluable to us. And um, I'm so thankful to God for, for Christian schools and for uh, churches that uh, just nurtured our kids. As you all know, Mitch was two of our kids' youth pastor. And that was so precious to us because we knew we could trust Mitch and uh, we knew that we could count on him. So I think uh, that, was, that was who I would say. I can't think of any one person that stands out in particular other than Steve, but um, God just brought the people that we needed when we needed them. I, one of the things I heard you all consistently saying is it's your family, your spouses, but it's the bigger church family as well. And so what a good reminder to each of us of just the importance that we play in the lives of others and that others, even maybe when we don't realize it, are depending on us. And so thank you, ladies, for letting me interview you. You can go ahead and go on that, and I'm going to ask um, our ushers to come forward. And so we have the, the offering that we'll pray
miss you like crazy, but we also know we get the Magnificent Four. What, Stan walked in my office the other day, and is it the four, Stan, is that what we decided, the Magnificent Four, or something like that? Fantastic Four, that's it. Well, it is great to have you in worship this morning, and there Every time we celebrate a special day, like Mother's Day or Father's Day, there's a real tear between staying focused on the road you've chosen, and right now we're in the middle of studying what? The Apostles' Creed. There you go. You're, you're torn between pulling away from that or and focusing on the importance of the day, which this is a very important day, by the way, or stay in the lane you're in. And the great part about where we're at in the Apostles' Creed is we can stay in our lane and still celebrate moms. But even more important, celebrate the church. Today we're talking about, and we're picking up where we left off last week, it, it, the importance of unity among us. Now, I have had the privilege, and most of you know my background. I, I served as youth pastor uh, at two places the longest, and probably the, where I really learned how to be a youth pastor was uh, with Steve and Linda at Faith Community Church and under the ministry of, of Jerry McGee. Uh, Jerry literally taught me the ins and outs of ministry, and then the day that I walked in to I was really afraid. I was walking in to ask Jerry permission if I could go pastor the church in Yuma. I may not have had that right, and Jerry pointed that out to me really quick. He said, are you asking me if you can follow God's call on your life? Is that what you're doing? And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, I wouldn't want to be you if you don't. But then I entered into a time of... of pastoring church, and, and I'll never forget, I walked in to one of those first initial interviews, and here I was, a 27, eight-year-old guy in a senior adult church, and I walked in, and I asked them, I asked them this question, how is it going to work for a guy that's never pastored before? that's 28 years old. How is it really gonna work for me to serve as your pastor? By the way, I don't remember the exact number. I think we had nine retired pastors in the congregation, okay? I, this is just didn't have good written on anywhere. The chairman of the search committee, who was a retired minister, looked at me and said this. It, uh, the room got very quiet, by the way, when I asked that question. And he said, you know, Mitch, I guess the way I would answer that, if there are any problems, you'll create them. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that, that's for sure. And you know, since then, I have had the privilege of serving, even when I was with the convention, I was uh, just kind of because of my, the gifts and talents that God gave me. We had, uh, in the denomination I served, we had about 460 churches. And it, over time, it, it kind of seemed like every church that was broken or really messed up that I would end up going there. And God began to hone in and give me some gifts on dealing with conflict and dealing with brokenness. And, and what I've learned over those years is this. The number one tool that Satan will use to, do, to tear a church apart is lack of unity. If he can get a foothold, if he can crack that door, or really if we crack the door and let him get his foot in just to create a lack of harmony, a little bit of divisiveness, then the human nature comes out in us. 
I was driving down the road yesterday with my wife and my youngest son called. Hopefully he's online listening right now because I do need to give him credit for this. And he asked me, he said, Dad, do you remember you bought Michael and I? Now our sons are just about 18 months apart, is that correct? And so they, they've always been really close in age. They played football on the same Pop Warner teams. I mean, it, just, it was really kind of cool having them in that age group, not to mention convenient. You didn't have to go to different ball games or anything. But anyway, uh, we bought them, and I don't know if it was Mona and I or my mom and dad. I'm not sure who the initiator was, but we bought them boxing gloves. <laughs> at age six and seven, which is even worse, okay? And we're driving, down the road. I'm driving through Gilbert yesterday and my son said, hey, Dad, do you by any chance remember, and here's how much he remembers it, you bought Mike and I red boxing gloves when we were kids. What motivated you to do that? <laughs> I have no idea. I, you know, why do you ask? And he said, well, I was telling Becca about it today. And, and he said, you know, I, it just, that doesn't seem really like a gift that parents would buy their kids because you're encouraging them to fight. And I said, well, Brad, we didn't, you know, we never wanted you to fight, but I wanted you, and listen to this, I wanted you to know how to protect yourself in the midst of an attack. And here's what Brad said at six years old. And I said, well, you know what I do know for certain? I've got two young men that would not back down at anything if the six women in my life needed their help. Now, is that as a result of boxing gloves? Probably not. I think God planted within them something that is just part of a, of, of a protector that they have deep within them. And whether it's their two sisters or any of the other women in their lives, or my new son-in-law for that matter, I, I want you to know, and, and I don't mean this in any self-goofy way, Jesus could call me home right now, and there's one thing that I would never worry about, and that is this. Are the women in my life, my wife, my daughters, my daughter-in-laws, my granddaughters, will they ever have to worry about protection? And because of the two young men that God blessed me with and my son-in-law, I can honestly say right now, no, I don't have anything to worry about. All three of those men love God. All three of those men love their, their spouses and their children and, and their sisters, and they're going to take care of them. Now, some of you would say, Mitch, what does have, that have to do with unity in the church? Ask it. I'm giving you permission right now. You're thinking it. How are you my brother? Like it or not? <laughs> Kathy, you're my sister. Uh -oh. See that? There's an honest voice. <laughs> and if we can't count on each other, then we've got problems, y'all. If we cannot count on a brother or sister in Christ having my back when I don't have my back, then I'm in big trouble. And now, Mitch, you're, you're confusing us because you're, you're going kind of all the way around the issue. Well, if you brought your Bibles this morning, and I pray you did because this is called church, y'all. And we study the Bible in church. Ephesians chapter 2. Oh, I'm sorry, Philippians. I knew that. I knew that. I've got it right here in front of me. <laughs> you do. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. I appreciate it. 
I need someone to help me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul said, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. That right there, I, you know what, how many of you would, would raise your hand if you were honest and say, Mitch, it's Mother's Day, we got big plans, you just preached your sermon, let's go. Raise your hand. Good. We're all united then. You want to step? I hope you didn't put the roast in yet. Mary Ellen, I wish she's Mary Ellen's face right now. She's like, oh Lord, what has he just done? You know, we talked last week about, uh, we talked about the church as a whole. Now remember, we, we transitioned as we look at the Apostles' Creed. We went from our personal relationship. That is the, the direction where we're up. I believe in God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. And in his, our, our Lord. Maker, so that's all right, too. We're, we're, you get credit for that one. So it, it, it is that relationship up, but now we're coming down a little bit. We went way down a couple weeks ago, right? When we talked about Jesus descending into hell and, and taking care of stuff, business. Now, we right now are talking about the relationship in this room. Has anyone, and I'm here, I'm getting ready to ask you to be honest. And when you're honest, it means you're going to raise your hand or keep your hand down, okay? But, but I want you to, to just do this real quick so you got your arms ready to go. Has anyone in this room ever been a part of a church that was divided or in argument? Five of us. Okay, good. Do you realize that that was not God's plan, y'all? God does not want us arguing with one another. I didn't buy my boys boxing gloves so they could get mad at one another and just fight. I bought them boxing gloves, and really I think Mona did, just so they could expend energy in the afternoon and sleep at night. <laughs> but again, what did those boxing gloves kind of give them the ability to do? Protect themselves, that's right. You know what I learned early on in Ernestine, I'm going to tell this story, and I don't know if you are aware of it or not. I've only been knocked out once in my life, and that was by her son <laughs> in my backyard. <laughs> Did you know that, Ernestine? No. We were back in the backyard messing around, and we found, I don't know where the boxing gloves came from. It was myself and Mike and Chuck and Jim, and we were just out there messing around with some high school kids or maybe junior high, I don't know, and, and we put these boxing gloves on, and I thought we were just going to kind of play fight. We're just going to like, do this. And I'm going to tell you, I got out there with Mike, and... There was no plan to be involved at that point. All right, this is what he planned. And I figured out, well, he's serious about this. I need to figure out how to protect myself. But it was at that point that there was a right hand that had come back from way back yonder. And it come across and caught me somewhere up here in the head. I don't remember where. What I do remember, though, is Mike and Chuck saying, Mitch, get up before your mom comes out. Come on, get up. Get up before your mom comes out. But you know, that's the only time I've ever been knocked out in my life. 
Now, I don't want you to think I've ever been in a lot of personal altercations. I haven't been. But I learned in that. And, and why would you remember that, Mitch? Is that because Ernestine's in the room? No. That's because the only time I've been knocked out. And some of us emotionally or physically or spiritually have been knocked out because we were not prepared for the fight. We were not prepared for the altercation. One of the church leaders and I are going through a book, and, and I'm, not, I, I'm not going to embarrass him by naming or anything, but it, it is from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. Dietrich was a Lutheran pastor, and, and really he did some of his most amazing writing when he, it, uh, early in his ministry. And I had given this church leader one of the books, just, and I was really testing the waters with him, that's what I was doing. And he latched on to it, and he read the whole book faster than any human that I've ever known. And I said, well, hey, there's another one here. And, and he and I are reading through it. And he grabbed me Wednesday night and he pulled me aside. And he said, Mitch, I, I got the, I, well, really, it had not come through Amazon yet. So he had gone to the library and got the audio copy. And he said, I've listened to chapters one and two over and over and over again. And I said, why is that? Why, why, just listen to it once and you're fine. You, the book's coming, I promise. And he said, no, I, I am captivated. I am, I am caught. I am scared to death of the reality of what's written in those first two chapters. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I asked him, I said, what, what are you referring to? And he said, cheap grace. He said, cheap grace when that young man wrote about how lazadaisical we approach grace and God's love and goodness and investment in us he says it scares me to my very core and and, and I, I'm just I'm going to use words that make some of you uncomfortable but I want to say this According to Philippians, Paul, when he wrote that church in Philippi, they were a church that, that had bought into this concept, this reality of cheap grace. Now remember, we're part of a big church. We used the garden last week, right or wrong? And we talked about the rose garden and how a rose blooms and the importance of understanding that as that rose blooms, how many petals at a time does it bloom? One. One petal at a time. And the flower's not complete unless that petal before it bloomed. And that, that rose is not complete if that petal behind is sick or ill and can't bloom. And, and just to be kind of creative, Tracy says it's cheesy. I disagree with that. It's just creative. We're going to stay in that gardening motif for the next five minutes. And I'm going to shoot some things at you, but I've got good news. If you have no plans Wednesday night at 630, we're going to be right back here again. All right. We're taking a week off from our study in Proverbs, and we are going to be right back in this and if you don't normally attend on Wednesday nights and I want you to attend I want you to be there because the ch I want you to see the church as a garden Paul said that, that we've got to be a church that is together and, and we look at things and I'm not going to go through row the, there, I'm not going to go through row one or row two there are five well, really, there are seven rows in the church garden. I'm just going to do rows three, five, and six. That's all I'm going to do. Well, uh, three, four, and five. I'm sorry. Three, four, and five. We're going to skip rows one and two. We're not going to go any further. But we need to have three rows of squash. How many have ever grown squash? Anybody? There you go. I don't know jack about squash. I was in Walmart last night. 
trying to find squash to show you as a visual. I couldn't find squash. I wouldn't even know what to look at. But I do know that a church, a healthy church garden, has squash in it. Three rows of squash. Number one, it's going to be one that squashes indifference. That's good. I don't care who you are. That's good. You squash indifference. Before you walk through those doors on Sunday morning, you're going to leave your indifference in the parking lot and you're going to get it right before you come in. And then secondly, you're going to squash criticism. Some of you last week had fried pastor for lunch. I hope you went home hungry. <laughs> we got to get rid of criticism, y'all. We just do. Criticism in our church, criticism in our home, and that means we just humble ourselves and accept the fact that, listen, we're all filled with flaws. I am frail. I am fractured. I'm flawed. Get over it. So are you. We got to squash indifference. We got to squash criticism. And then most importantly, according to Proverbs 2019, and we're going to be there a lot on Wednesday night, we've got to squash gossip. Amen. You know what gossip is in the church? Linda, can I share a prayer request with you? Now, Linda, I don't want you to share this prayer request with anybody. It's just with you. And Linda, because she loves me and wants to make sure there are a lot of people praying for me, she does what? I want, no, it's not gossip. It's prayer requests. It's prayer needs. Linda goes, now Linda won't do that, by the way. I, you notice I picked on her because I can't pick any other direction. That's not true. That was funny. <laughs> Linda says, hey, pastor shared this with me. I need you to be praying about it. Do you realize, there are some that believe this. By verbally speaking, that's gossip, not listening. You know what gossip is? Listen, speaking and listening. If you listen to something you know you ought not be listening to, then you're gossiping. And when you begin to hear something you ought not be hearing, then it's your duty as a child of God to say this. Howie, I don't think I ought to be listening to this. Well, what do you mean? I, I'm just not sure. This is something I ought to be listening to. It doesn't sound like this is healthy. Now, you might lose a friend or two, but you will gain favor in the eyes of God. Okay, let's go to our next row. Three rows of squash. We've got to hurry. There are going to be four rows of turnips. Now, I did see turnips, by the way. We've got to turn up for meetings. <laughs> that is good. Hebrew says, and you've heard me say this about 112,000 times, not to forsake the gathering together. Right? Sometimes we vote by absence. Sometimes we vote by giving or lack thereof. But listen, we cannot vote by not showing up. We've got to turn up for worship. We've got to turn up for prayer meetings. I don't know how many we had in prayer meeting last week, y'all. But I, I'm going to tell you, there was an empty chair too. If you have no plans, if you don't have any heart surgery planned tomorrow morning at 930, if you don't have any, I mean, if it, unless you're going to see your cardiologist or or something big 9 30 tomorrow morning over in the church office it's prayer time it's prayer time 
You want to know why the church in Korea is growing so fast? Fastest growing church in the world today is in South Korea. I can tell you why. Because about the last 25, 30 years, every morning in every, not every Christian church, but every church that's really focused on growth, every morning at 5 a.m., seven days a week, they show up for prayer meeting. Every day, 5 o'clock in the morning, they show up for prayer meeting. Now, if I were to ask for a list of votes on that one, how many of you feel like that's extreme? Oh, a couple of hands might grow, go up, but a couple of minds would say, I think that's crazy. But the church is growing. Not only show up for me, turn up for meetings, you turn up with a smile. I read this week about 14 different verses how a glad heart can soothe a weary heart. How a smile can, can, can be an ointment to a broken spirit. Isn't it interesting what a smile will do? Isn't it interesting how if we're just, if we go to someone and we just are ingratiating to them, they become ingratiating to us. Second thing is you need to turn up with a visitor. I don't know all your neighbors, but you do. And we've got some of you. We've got one, one uh, church member that they had not even completely moved in yet. And she had them at church the following Sunday. That's turn up right there. That's a turn up Christian if I ever heard it. Turn it up with folks saying, hey, you need to come and be a part of what we're doing down here. You need to come and show or, or just let us show you what it means to be a part of the Sun Lakes community. Turn up for the meetings. Turn up with a smile. Turn up with a visitor. And then I'm going to say this again. You're going to think this is silly. Turn up with a Bible. Y'all, listen, we believe in the Word of God. And I've got to tell you, I want to encourage you, if you will bring this, we'll refer to this, and it will give you something home, or it will give you something to take home that you can turn to to look at what we talked about on Sunday. It, it's just, that's church. That's church. That is church. Let's go. We, we, it's in a hurry. I, I'm in a hurry right now. We got to go to row five, and that's lettuce. Now, I'm, I, uh, I served in Yuma. I, some of you don't know this, but Yuma is the winter. It, it's the lettuce capital of the world during the winter. In, in the entire world. The Yuma and Imperial Valley produce more lettuce than anybody else. I think the church ought to get in the lettuce business. Ask me how. Come on. Let us love one another. <laughs> oh, I got four more. Don't worry. Let us love one another. There are some in this room. You live by yourself. Maybe you're widowed or maybe you're divorced. Maybe you're estranged from your kids or maybe your kids live on the East Coast. But all you want in your heart of hearts is a little bit of love. COVID has kicked our tails when it comes to love. You might be taking care of someone at home and you just want to know that someone loves you. I was making a visit last week to one of our church members and she had been caring for her husband and it just, I really didn't know what I was going to walk into. I thought I was going to walk in to some trouble. I thought they were going to look at me and say, Pastor, where have you been? Which they could have said. But when I walked in, you know what? She turned up at the door with a smile <laughs> and that relaxed my heart. And I walked in to his room and we just began loving on one another. 
And it was probably one of the best visits I've had in months. Why? Because everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to be loved. Let us love one another. Let us welcome strangers. I had someone, I have two stories here. Someone walked up to someone else in church about three weeks ago and said, Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm glad you came to visit with us today. So-and-so reached out and shook that person's hand and said, I've been here for four years. <laughs> you know, you could be in a room as small as this and still be strangers. That's the whole reason Brother Steve is doing these interviews. So we can get to know one another. When you come on Monday mornings, you know what we spend a lot of time doing? Getting to know one another. You show up on Wednesday nights, Tracy always has a question about something crazy. Whether it's how your home was heated and when you were in the fourth grade, or I don't even know what this past week's question was. But we get to know one another. That is so important that we love one another, that we welcome ourselves. If we're strangers or we're friends, we welcome each other. Let us be faithful to our duty, not just in the church, but in this community. Let's be faithful. Let us be faithful to the duty God's called us to. Let us truly worship God. Not just going through the motions. I asked a question. I was teaching, if you can imagine me teaching a senior adult women's class. I'm pastor, little church. I'm the senior adult ladies class teacher. And I asked, why would y'all come today? And one woman looked at me and she kind of squared up. And she said, it's Sunday, isn't it? I said, well, you could have gone anywhere you wanted. She said, Sunday, you go to church. Now, I'm glad you're here today. I don't want you to go anywhere else. But let us show up and let us worship when we show up. Let's not buy into this cheap grace, but let us worship when we show up. Then finally... Give liberally. When we show up, and that, that, by the way, that's not just money. Give of your time. Give of your heart. Give of all those strengths, talents, and abilities that God's blessed you with. Give liberally. And people will be blessed. And listen, we believe in the holy Christian church. It's a big old church, y'all. But it's a church that's made up of a group of individuals like us. So here's your homework. If every church in the world today were as strong as me as a believer, what does that say about the church? What does that say about the big church? The, the big church. If my little church is a part of it. Father, <laughs> we've You've given us the privilege to be silly, but serious. You've blessed us with a little bit of humor, but a whole lot of holy presence. Oh God, we ask that you bless us. just with a fury to get out of here because we've gone over. 
but bless us with fire that we might leave this place with a smile. And someone at some point today, Lord, would ask us, what are you smiling about? And we'd have the strength to say, I, I was at church today. And it was fun. I was at church today and, and I got fed. It was at church today that I got a message to share with you. In Christ's name, all God's people said. Amen. Brother Dale, come with us. face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and lift his countenance on you. And in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may the Lord God give you peace. God bless you. You're dismissed. See you tomorrow morning at 930, Wednesday night at 630.